2. Tarzan and Jane The Story of Carlisle Smitty and Louise Harris Greg Godek, co-author note. As of this book's publication date, Tarzan and Jane have been happily married 62 years. Lee's co-author note. 46 years after returning home, following nearly eight years as a prisoner of war in a North Vietnam POW camp, my former cellmate, Colonel Carlisle Smitty Harris, wrote the marvelous book, Tap Code, the epic survival tale of a Vietnam POW and the secret code that changed everything. In the foreword to his book, I wrote that, upon return to America, most of us had a wonderful reunion and moved on. It seemed that the Harris family just stayed in the reunion mode. That's the kind of couple that Tarzan and Jane, a.k.a. Smitty and Louise, are. Louise and I started over where we had left off. It was as if I had simply taken a walk around the block. Smitty's walk around the block included 2,871 days during which he endured torture, starvation, fear, and loneliness. Louise's walk included raising their three children, single-handedly taking on the Air Force bureaucracy, and fighting various cultural norms and business practices that discriminated against women. During those years, she also sent more than a hundred care packages to Vietnam for Smitty. Much later, she learned that he had received only two of them. Several factors contributed to Smitty's surviving the POW camps, his religious beliefs, his family, and his cultural background and humor. Referring to the Hanoi Hilton, where he spent most of those years, Smitty said, The Hanoi Hilton, what an awful place. Room service, food, and accommodations were terrible. After a pause, he observed, Humor helped me keep a semblance of my former self. For example, Smitty's first letter to Louise included this, I have started daily exercises and am sure that when I'm released, I can get a job on TV with an exercise program, and I can be the idol of a million American women. What do you think of that? It was a miracle that this letter got delivered at all. It was among a handful of POW's letters that the North Vietnamese communists showed to several foreign diplomats in an effort to prove that they were in compliance with the Geneva Conventions. The captors never delivered any of those letters. But one of the British diplomats slipped one of the letters into her bag when no one was looking, and she later mailed it to Louise from England. Smitty related that at one point he and some other POWs were being moved to a different camp, and as usual, they were all blindfolded. As he sat in the back of the hot, jolting truck, he glanced down and, through the edge of his blindfold, spotted on the floor his most prized possession, a letter from Louise that had fallen out of his pocket. He chuckled, saying that as he retrieved it, he thought, I have always been a very lucky person, or perhaps someone was looking out for me. Do any of you readers think it's astounding and funny that a prisoner of war would consider himself to be lucky? Meanwhile, back in America. Smitty's wife Louise had been a very adventurous airline stewardess, but now the challenges she faced, as the first Air Force wife of an MIA, were beyond anyone's imagination. At the time of Smitty's capture, she and their two toddler daughters, ages three and five, and one son on the way, were living with him on the air base of the Japanese island of Okinawa. As the first POW wife to be living overseas, she was the first person to experience some of the newly established, untested military procedures, which she found totally unacceptable. The U.S. Air Force and the U.S. government were completely unprepared for the power and influence that one determined woman could wield. They were about to learn. Louise was eight months pregnant with their third child when Smitty's aircraft went down. The commanders on the base in Okinawa had never experienced a situation like this. They were uncomfortable with how her presence might send a message of loss and fear to the other fighter pilot wives. They were also concerned that her presence might even lower morale among the pilots as well. So they decided to ship her back to the States to give birth. The military was accustomed to dealing with cooperative and non-questioning military wives. They were not used to female grit and sound logic. Knowing more about babies than the military brass did, Louise informed them that she was going to stay right there in Okinawa until after the baby was born, and she got her way, and that was only at the beginning. 
When she arrived back in the States, she was met by a young lieutenant escort who told her that she would be receiving only $350, less than one-third, of Smitty's pay with which to raise three children, while the larger portion would go into a 10% savings account until his return. Louise was having none of it. The young Air Force officer who tried to help her was rattled when she said, this is unacceptable. She demanded that he get the secretary of the Air Force on the phone. Ma'am, I can't call the secretary of the Air Force, he said nervously. You do the dialing and I'll do the talking. Tell them that you are with the wife of the MIA Captain Carlisle Smith Harris, who insists that she talks to the secretary of the Air Force. Tell them she is very upset and is threatening to call a news conference. Her actions were all the more remarkable when you remember that this was 1965, a time when few American women broke ranks from their expected roles as good mothers and obedient wives. On the phone, when confronted with the problem, the secretary of the Air Force said, Ma'am, we are just looking out for your husband. Well, you better think about his children. I expect to hear back from you by close of business today. Mrs. Harris, I need some time to look into this. I'll get back to you soon. In her oh-so-polite southern drawl, Louise said, Sir, soon is unacceptable. I need an answer today. I have three babies to care for. Please get back to me by five. Thank you. And she hung up. And she got what she wanted. And she got it by five. Meanwhile, back in Vietnam. In addition to his sense of humor, Smitty brought with him into captivity one piece...